Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the Justice Project, and I'm honored to be here. Thank you for the invitation, OAC. We should have like a, a you know chant for OAC here. So um, I'll tell you what we're going to do today. We're going to. Uh, I'm told I'm the only one of the speakers that brought a video clip, and that's because it's after lunch, guys. And I, I do not want you falling asleep. We are not falling asleep with this wonderful lunch in your stomach. So, all right, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to cover a little bit of a waterfront. I am going to get to the issues that the judge mentioned, but I'm going to sort of uh, back up a little bit and give some perspective about um, criminal justice, which probably sounds like you might have already hit some of earlier today. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and jump in. I'm going to first tell you sort of, uh, you, you know, let's make sure this works good, sort of who we are. I, I'm, uh, I've been at the Georgia Justice Project for 28 years full time. I saw Jimmy, there's Jimmy. Uh, who, <laughs> who preceded me at the Georgia Justice Project, uh, uh, even in the early, late 80s. But I've been there for a while. Uh, we're a small nonprofit. We uh, are on um, Edgewood Avenue in the old Fourth Ward. Uh, our focus, i just give you a quick slide here to get you a sense of who we are. We do direct service, and we do policy work. Uh, the, our direct service is really, I think of it in three buckets. Uh, first is sort of our, our holistic criminal defense, and we're uh, we're like a private public defender, and if we represent somebody, what makes us different is we stay with our folks in the prison, visit them, take our clients' families to visit them in prison, and follow folks after prison to help them get back on their feet. So reentry has always been part of our work for our 32 years. We were founded in 1986. Um, and then about 15 years ago, we got really into criminal records work. And we had seen and known, following our folks coming out of prison, that uh, having a record is a huge barrier to employment and to housing, the two sort of pillars to get somebody back on their feet after they've had an encounter with the system. And so we got more into criminal records work, and so that's become the second bucket of our work, and actually the biggest bucket of our work uh, is representing people actually all over the state. Well, I think last year we were in 79 different counties in some way in the state, uh, helping people get things off the record, clean up the record, expunge the record, fix the record, change it, or get an opportunity like housing, jobs, school, in spite of their record. So that's become a big part of our work. And of course, once we got into that work, we realized that the laws in Georgia weren't uh, too amenable to those who had been in, encountered the system. So we went upstream in our battle and decided to focus on, uh, on changing the law for those who've been uh, touched by the system. And so that's where our policy work uh, and of course our outreach and education come in. So that's a quick overview of our work. We're about a, a million, million and a half dollar budget, depending on how you count. Uh, about 19 staff uh, and uh, have trained about 250 volunteer lawyers in our criminal records work. Some of you in the, in the room might have been one of those we trained to take on cases, uh, the handful of lawyers that are here. So, all right, that's a quick overview of our work so you know who you're, who's talking to you, right? You with me? All right, now we're going to get a little deeper, if I can follow this. So most of you know about where we are as a country in terms of mass incarceration, that we have 5% of the world's population and 25% of those incarcerated. This is a chart we use a lot to talk about uh, how we got here. And how we got here is really, th this chart shows as a percent of the population what incarceration was like in this country for really the better part of 100 years up until, and it remained relatively stable up until the, the early 70s and the mid 80s. And you see the, the growth in the 80s happen. And of course, those of you who have, who have read Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, know sort of where that came from. And it started with, uh, the war on drugs, uh, you know, essentially, and then, of course, uh, the, 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 the sentencing reforms in the 80s. And so this is the beginning of the arc of growth in this country, where, uh, and the way I like to say it, talking to Georgians, and when I moved to Georgia in the mid-80s, uh, in about 85, 86, we had about 8,000 people in the prison system, uh, of which about 80% of those people were uh, violent offenders. Uh, you fast forward to essentially, you know, five or so years ago, and we're at about 54, 55,000 people in the prison system. And the, the, the tide is changing back, but uh, the vast majority of folks who've populated this curve were nonviolent offenders. And so that's, it really changed who we're incarcerating and why. So um, just to get you some orientation as to how we got here, um, this chart should actually bring all of those who aren't already in a church to church because uh, this is a chart of those under correctional control in the country. Georgia has been leading the country of those under correctional control. Correctional control is defined as jail, prison, probation, or parole. Four things, jail, prison, probation, or parole. And the Pew Center for the States has done this crunching every year for years. In America, it's about one in 35, one in 36 people are under correctional control. Georgia has led the country 
uh, at 1 and 13. As of now, we are 1 and 12 under correctional control. This chart is, in, uh, is incredibly instructive because you, the question is, how do we get there? Why are we there? And you, it's hard to see, I know, and we can send this to folks, and hopefully the OAC will be glad to, I will be glad to forward our PowerPoint. But the chart, the reason we're here is because of that very top line, which is Georgia, by the way, and that big sort of purple part of that line, which is probation. Uh, Georgia leads the country on the number of folks on probation. Uh, we have people serving longer. We have more people on probation. And so this is why we remain at the top of the chart of those under correctional control. So um, again, this, this chart usually wakes people up a bit. If my video doesn't, maybe that will. All right, so of course, in our work, I want to talk about criminal records. In America, roughly 70 to 100 million people, according to the Department of Justice, have a criminal record. And what I mean by that, and what people who do this work mean, it doesn't mean just conviction. It can be an arrest or conviction. Somebody who has a criminal record is, represents about a third of the American population. In Georgia, however, it's worse, uh, as all the numbers, if you, you're getting the trend here, uh, is that uh, roughly 40% of adults in, America, in Georgia have a criminal record. And this is from GCIC, and we can talk more about these data points. Uh, so we have the worst of it here. And, oh, and you say, well, what is it? Well, I'm going to get to this. Now you say, now comes my clip. Uh, the criminal record issue we've been focused on for a long time. And some would say, given our work, we've really been focused on it for 30 years. Um, but um, the question is, criminal records in this population has become such a big part of the population, 100 million people roughly in America, that it's penetrating into popular culture. I give a number of talks. Some of you lawyers who put up with me at some of your firms have heard me give talks using movies. I love to use movies. And one of the things I was shocked taking my kids to see movies is that criminal records is showing up in superhero movies, which really shocked me because if, if it's a problem for superheroes, how much of a problem it is for the average person. So the one clip I'm going to show is from Ant-Man, which was filmed in Atlanta. And uh, is it Bill? If we can try to start the clip, that'd be great. I come in on the left side, right? Just down here, you see this right now? <laughs> I'm gonna miss you, Scott. I miss you too, Peachy. <laughs> Man, you guys got the weirdest goodbye with you. Oh, Some going away present. Oh, yeah. I still got my scarf from a year ago. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh. yeah. You know what? I'm still the only one to knock him out. Well, I definitely didn't. Thanks for picking me up, brother. Oh, well, you know, do you think I'm going to miss my celly getting out? Hey, how's your girl, man? Uh, she left me. Oh. Yeah, my mom died, too. And my dad got deported. But I got the van. It's nice. Yeah, right? Thanks for the hookup, too. I need a place to stay. You wait till you see this couch. You're going to be really happy. You're going to be on your feet in no time. Watch. I hope so. Yeah. And I got to introduce you to some people, some really skilled people. Not interested. Yeah, right. No, I'm serious, man. I'm not going back. I got a daughter to take care of. You know that jobs don't come easy for ex-cons, right? Look, man, I got a master's in electrical engineering, all right? I'm going to be fine. La verdad se acabó. Se quedó. Welcome to Baston Robbins. Would you like to try our mango fruit blast? Uh, no thanks. Um, I will have... I'll have a burger, please. Oh, we don't... We don't make that. Pretzel. Hot pretzel, like mustard... You know, mustard dip. It's ice cream. Baston Robbins. I'll just do, like, whatever's hot and fresh. David. Can I see you in the back, Chief? Pronto. Sure thing, Dale. Darby, could you just, uh, take care of this idiot? Thanks. Hey, Dale. Come on in. 
pull up some chair. Three years at San Quentin, huh? You found out. Baskin Robbins always finds out. Look, I'm sorry, all right, but I, I, no one would hire me. Breaking and entering, grand larceny. Look, I'm, I'm sorry. I, you know, it was I, I don't do it anymore. I just try. Respect. I couldn't be happier about it. Really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you. You really stuck it to those billionaire SOBs. And the more I read about what you did and stuff, I'm like, wow, I know this guy. I'm in charge of this guy. Well, I'm very happy in this job, and I'm, I, I really just yeah, appreciate the yeah. opportunity to Well, help you're fired, me. of course. I mean, to, uh, can't really keep you on. Wait, what? Fired? Yeah. Dale, look, it wasn't a violent crime. I mean, I'm a good worker. No, it wasn't a violent crime. It was a cool crime. I'll tell you what, though. This would be totally off the books, off the records, but uh, if you want to grab one of those uh, mango fruit blasts on your way out the door, I'll just pretend I didn't see it. What's up? Oh, you're supposed to be at work. I was. I got fired. Damn. They find out who you are? Yeah. Baskin Robbins always finds out, bro. Baskin Robbins don't play. You want some waffles? Hell, I'll take a waffle. Oh, that's Kurt. He was Folsom for five years. He's a wizard on that laptop. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you, too. Okay, I'll stop it there because what, what happens next is basically... You see what happens. He gets out of prison, even has an education, can't get a job, gets fired because of his criminal record, and he gets pulled back into criminal conduct. That's what they're going to talk about next. But if you haven't seen the movie, I encourage you to see it. It's quite fun. But more importantly, it lifts up some of the issues that we address every day in our office. So let me um, talk about what lawyers call collateral consequences, the impact of having a record. Uh, the ABA has studied this, and they have come up with that there are 47,000 laws in America that are collateral consequences. If you have a record, arrested or convicted, it can impact your life in the civil side of the world, housing, jobs, education, benefits, with regard to your record. Um, and this can uh, you know, happen in lots of different ways. Obviously immigration, people hear a lot about, adoption, et cetera. So this is a, this is a big issue for folks. We tend to, just like this movie clip, we tend to focus a lot on employment. Because employment uh, actually is the number one, if you will, antidote to recidivism. In other words, the best data out there says that if somebody has a job after they have been arrested or convicted, uh, they are less likely to commit another crime. So the, uh, the tension here is that if you have a job uh, you're, and you have a record, you're less likely to commit another crime. However, uh, 60 to 70 percent of those 47,000 laws are related to employment. So you, you see the conundrum that, that gets created. Um, and this, of course, does not impact people across the board, is that if you have a record, you have a, a, a massive decrease in whether you'll get a callback. If you're a person of color, an African-American male in this culture, and you have a record, your numbers drop below a white male without a criminal record. I'm sorry, let me inverse. An African-American man without a record has less chance of getting a callback than a white man with a record. And my point is, is that it's, it, you know, these things are not, of course, uh, evenly distributed their impacts, but it has a massive impact on people getting back on their feet. Um, so uh, one of the ways we I already talked about, you know, we talk about employment is that if we are serious as a, as a community about reducing recidivism, of course, which a number of folks in our culture have been, uh, uh, the governor and his efforts uh, in the criminal justice reform, which I know you heard about earlier today, have focused on reducing recidivism, uh, then we know we have to be serious about employment. Uh, there's a number of studies out there that show that we lose, as a country, about $80 billion in GDP because we keep folks out of the, uh, the employment arena. Uh, so, uh, and in Georgia, unfortunately, the last study that was done, and this is a few years ago, there hasn't been another one, but Georgia ranks second worst in the country for creating barriers if you have a record to employment. 
We've counted, we've tried uh, over almost 900 laws in Georgia. We kind of stopped counting. Actually, that 47,000 number, I'm pretty sure the ABA stopped counting at 47,000. Uh, there are so many laws out there that you create an impediment uh, for folks who have a record. So, but one of the things we have been doing a lot of is trying to bring in employers to talk about uh, there's actually a positive case for those with records. A number of studies around the country, particularly in the military, Johns Hopkins in particular too, there's a, a, a honey, uh, there's a farm, uh, there's a number of uh, uh, I should say agricultural and farming uh, units in the, in the Midwest who have done studies of hiring people who have been convicted. And what's interesting is that uh, you know, quite consistently, employers that hire folks who have a criminal record, and often even serious felonies, uh, have uh, those employers have a higher retention rate with those employees. They are promoted more uh, aggressively than those without a record. And uh, they become better employees because of their loyalty to the company. Uh, so there's a number of studies that are being produced more and more that show that, again, quite counterintuitive is that if you hire folks with a record from a business standpoint, it's better for your business to do that. So, th so one of the things we try to talk to folks about to make sure the word's out there. Let me see if I can get this. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay. All right. Oh, let me go back. Sorry. Too far. So let me get back into, let me get down into criminal records, just what the judge said. I know my charge today is to talk about what, how a criminal record works and what can come off and what can't. We do two-hour CLEs on this. I, I, I have half an hour to get you oriented to the issue. I'm not going to try to educate you about how to do expungements and how the, the, the law works exactly. But let me give you just a high-level perspective here. Is in Georgia, the current law is that if you have a non-conviction, uh, it can basically come off your record. A non-conviction are you know, acquittals and uh, you know, dead dockets, null process, MPGJ, I'm talking uh, lawyer talk to those in the room. But the point is, is a non-conviction can come off your record. Uh, it can come off really first through an administrative process, a record restriction, formerly called expungement, uh, which goes through the court, really the, the police and the DA and the GCIC. And then we all, uh, there's another avenue. Once that happens, you can go to the court and ask for that record to be sealed. And that sealing that record, it's a discretionary call by the judge, but uh, as uh, Judge Kirk knows all too well, because she's done this uh, uh, for something I want to talk about, but the point is, is when that happens, that keeps those records away from the private background check companies. Because if you have a record and, and, you, and it shows up every time you apply for a job, even if it's restricted at the GCIC, meaning the rap sheet level, it doesn't have a big impact on your life. So one of the things that we've been able to do is get the legislature to advance this and allow for sealing. However, let me go to the other side of the column here on convictions. Unfortunately, if you're convicted in a state, there, are, there is not a quick and easy remedy, or really much of any remedy. Now, we'll say that, we, that there are a couple exceptions. The three things that are available, and two of these we, our office, created essentially legislatively in the last 10 years, but the two things that are available that are, require a judge's signature, you go in front of a judge and ask for what's called a youthful offender or a retroactive first offender. These are very small windows into a very dip, difficult issue, a very small window into a large population of people who have an arrest or conviction. Um, there's also the availability, Georgia does have a good pardon statute, uh, well known, so we actually do, uh, the, the Georgia Pardon and Parole Board creates a mechanism for people to have a pardon, except the problem, unfortunately, is that a pardon, if you're pardoned, it doesn't come off your criminal record. So the employer and the housing folks can still see your record uh, even if, I know, that's, what, that's exactly the way we, <laughs> he threw his hands up and that's sort of how we feel, but, but, but at least it's out there, at least it's out there. So these are sort of the quick overview of what's available, of how things can come off your record and what can't come off your record, which of course leads me uh, into what we're trying to do legislatively, and we have been, uh, this past year we got pretty close, uh, we got some movement um, around getting Georgia to get closer to the rest of the country. Uh, Georgia is only one of 12 states in the country where a conviction cannot come off your record. Uh, more and more states are doing this. More and more states are allowing uh, a criminal conviction not to be on your, sort of, the, your judge is essentially by the worst thing you've ever done or one of your worst days in your life that stays on your record forever. Uh, interestingly, I don't know if you heard the news today in the last couple of days, there's all this talk in Europe and the European Union about the right to be forgotten. Have you all some, heard, heard some of those reports? Uh, and the idea there is very similar, is that the idea that Google and all these other mechanisms keep information forever. There are big lawsuits in Europe who are challenging the fact that if something happened to somebody's life, it shouldn't be available for forever. And just today, I heard that Google and Facebook, or, or, or Google particularly, is going to start following the, 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 the European standard, which is going to change some of this. But the bottom line is, once you've been arrested or convicted, 
uh, even if you get a court record sealed, even if you get your GCIC restricted, sometimes it's available just through Google. You know, let's all say a prayer and hope that that could change, especially given the European Union pushing and having these big fines against some of these companies. But that's interesting to think about this. But anyway, so one of the things we're trying to do is to make it available so that people who, and, and we see this all the time, not just people who had a, an old conviction, 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. We see people with one conviction on the record every day who stops them from getting housing, particularly uh, uh, adult housing. We see it people, it's stopping people from getting a job, uh, people from being promoted. Uh, often when, uh, count, uh, when an employer, government or private, does a recertification and says, oh, we've got to check our employees, somebody who's worked there for decades gets fired because of an old 20, 30-year-old conviction. There is no mechanism in Georgia to let that come off your record. That's, again, our primary policy goal, and you're, you're getting where I'm going with this. We need your help to get there. So, um, but let me just uh, talk, let me go to the next slide. I know I'm trying to watch the time. Um, so on our policy work, as I mentioned, we do policy work. Uh, we've been at it for about 10 years, uh, as, uh, even though the organization is about 32 years old. And we've done a number of things about, uh, had a number of successes. I think we count about 19 successes in the last seven years. And of course, we're very, been very, uh, it's been a blessing to have the, the governor who's been supporting a lot of this and a lot of our bills, our suggestions have been incorporated into the, into the reform efforts. Some have been independent. However, uh, there's, we've done a lot of good work and we've had a lot of great allies to help us, but there's still a long way to go. We still have a lot of work to do. Um, this picture, for instance, is we've, for the last seven years or so, I told Francis, John, where's Francis, uh, he's here somewhere. There he is in the office. I know you we spoke at a couple of our justice days, um, but we've had a justice day at the Capitol for the last really seven years. This past year, we partnered with 33 other groups and had about 500 folks show up, all about pushing criminal justice reform. Uh, and this is one of the ways the, that we try to get the word out to legislators and others, and also create a vehicle for folks, directly affected folks, whomever to show up and say, I care about this issue uh, and I want my legislator or the legislators to know about this issue and, I'm, and I want to move the needle. Um, let me, let me see, I'm sorry, okay, okay. So, let me, okay, good. So now this next issue I want to talk about and I'm, I'm going to end a little bit early, Judge, which is amazing, actually. Uh, and I, see, I saw my friend John Eves come in. To, uh, so let me just, Georgia up until a year and a half ago had never had an expungement summit, an expungement event. Um, it's something that a number of other states have done around the country. Uh, John Eves, who's a, a good friend, when he was the chairman of the uh, Fulton County uh, Commission, or, um, came back and said, we have to do this. And within, he has really started a momentum in the state that is quite phenomenal. So in a matter of less than a year and a half, uh, we've counted at least, I, I forget all the numbers, I think it's six to eight different events that have taken place in a year and a half in the state since uh, since really John Eves came and said, we need to do one of these. Um, so what's happened, I mean, there were two this calendar year alone, one the Fulton County uh, Solicitor General, Keith Gamage, uh, pushed for. The other we just participated in over at uh, St. Philip's AME Church in DeKalb, uh, in Decatur, and that event was for DeKalb County arrests. Uh, we are working with the Rockdale County uh, Clerk of Court, and that, uh, that event is taking place in a few weeks. Clayton County is, is pulling one off in a few weeks after that. But here's what I want you to understand what these events mean. You know, we, um, we've become sort of the experts on criminal records. In fact, we produce our own book on criminal records. We sell these to lawyers. We give them the nonprofits. What will take us under the law months to do, and appropriately, it'll take us months to move somebody from having a record to not having a record, if allowed by law. These events take those months, get that down to 24 hours and at no cost, and Judges like Cassandra Kirk are there to sign orders sealing records, which we, I've seen, I've, we've been together on a Saturday or two where she's done this. These all take place on Saturday, interestingly. So these are powerful events, often, interestingly enough, led by, pushed for, and supported by the faith community. Uh, we're working, John is at his, temp, the temple is trying to pull one together. The, the event that took place in Troop County was primarily pushed for by a local pastor who lives in Clayton County, who's now pushing for this in Clayton County and has gotten the Clayton County players, mainly uh, county uh, commissioners, et cetera, involved. So these are wonderful, powerful tools that allow people to go from having a record to not having a record in a matter of hours with no cost. It's a huge impact. And um, so this is something, I want to put it out there for you, many of you who are faith leaders in various parts of the state, a way to, inter to intersect and impact this population, this issue. Because again, it's not just uh, lawyers or judges or county commissioners pulling this off, it's folks in the community. Um, 
I know there's at least two more planned for Fulton County. We're working with Peach County. There's a number of others happening. Uh, and so I just thought we'd put up a quick slide about what we thought were sort of some of the best practices with regard to these. If this interests you, if you say this is something we are able to do, or we want to do, let me just get this. So this is just a quick reference point to talk about uh, what the benefits are, but also who needs to be at the table. Just some of our, our key learnings over the last year and a half, again, working with folks like uh, Judge Kirk and John Eves. Um, one thing I want to point out is that you know, it really requires the government players at the table. They hold the keys to the kingdom in, the th in this regard. We're talking about court official records. We're talking about GCIC, which is the Georgia Crime Information Center. We're talking about state agencies, police, prosecutors. But what has been evidenced in the last uh, 18 months is that it can happen, is when the right people are in the room, they can get those players to the table and make this happen. The, the recent event we did with, with Keith Gamage in Fulton County um, a solicitor, they had over 1,500 people show up at a, a, a union building right next to the old Turner Field, and really about 400 people got their records cleared that day. These are powerful things, and it's, it's wonderful. Um, one other piece I would say here is that we, well, is that... Um, there's a lot more that can happen with these. We've heard from our friend Jay Neal, who's now the head of the CJCC. There are legislators who are talking about trying to have one as a statewide effort. So again, John, I really want to commend you for starting planting a seed that has really taken root and is starting to move throughout the state, but it can happen more with your all's involvement. So um, with that, I'm, uh, I'm sure I'm missing some things I should talk about, <laughs> but uh, I know we have a, a chance for questions. Uh, I think this is my last slide. Just to, this is a picture of our building. Again, we're an old, uh, we, we were, have an old gas station garage we've renovated a few times down on Edgewood Avenue. Um, but this work around criminal records, this work around really getting people back on their feet, I was talking with Tony Loudon earlier, and who we've known and worked with some. Uh, we're really excited about what's happening around the state. Uh, the Department of Corrections, Department of Community Supervision, a number of church and faith leaders. There's a, a coming together to really try to stem the tide of recidivism and help folks who've been impacted by the system not go back. And uh, in fact, if, I don't know if this has come up, but there's a new facility opening up, uh, opened up this week, technically, on the 22nd, called the Metro Reentry Facility. The Department of Corrections is opening that we've been uh, starting to work with. There's a number of ways. This is the first prison, by the way, the only prison inside the perimeter of, of, uh, of Atlanta. Most of the prisons, and I know some of you are from other parts of the state, most of the prisons in the state are you know, far flung in uh, parts of the state where the, the dirt is cheap. Uh, and, I, and I get it. I'm not mad at the DOC for putting them there. So this, this opportunity of having a prison inside the perimeter where folks can come together and make a difference with those returning is, is quite significant. So I'm going to stop there. And Judge, I think we're going to have some conversation and questions. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. Both. Uh, the law we got changed in 2013, uh, uh, wonderfully, it has an automatic provision. So if somebody's arrested after July 1st, 2013, and, the, and their case gets dismissed tomorrow or the day after, then under the law, it, basically their record is supposed to be automatically restricted. And that's through GCIC. That's why I bifurcated those two things. You still have to go back to a judge and ask for that record to be sealed if it made it to, into the courthouse. So you, and that requires a lawyer. I mean, it doesn't require, it's better to have a lawyer to do that. Um, we see, of course, pre-2013 requires both steps to be done manually, um, but we see a number of jurisdictions where, uh, you know, folks, the, I, I'm, the system is not doing it as it should, and you have to, somebody has to show up to advocate for that person to say, please restrict this. Under the new law. Yeah, you, you still can do it manually, but it's supposed to happen, most of it automatically, but it doesn't always. Yes, ma'am. So does your organization actually go out to the actual community? Oh. Oh, yeah. Uh, a ton. Uh, at the end of March, I counted for this fiscal year, th through uh, July through March, we had 71 different presentations we did at a number of places around the state. We probably had, we're probably going to be up to 80, 85 by the end of this fiscal year. In fact, we have a contract, one of the few pay for, pay, fee-for-service things we do with the Department of Community Supervision, that's probation and parole, to go train 
their PRI, the, the Prisoner Reentry Initiative. In fact, we're going to be in five other locations at their request about now in the end of September. So we show up in lots of communities. We do it. We show up to talk about what their records are. We talk to people who have a record, what can come off, what can't come off. We do a lot of training for uh, reentry folks. We do a lot of training, often when judges, when asked, because we see judges need training too, right, Justice? Uh, and lawyers as well. So we do a ton of training. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yes. Uh, did I put the dates on here? I'm sorry. I forgot. I know the date for the J June the 9th is the, is the event in Rockdale County. Uh, Clayton is September, or is it, uh, Brenda, what is the date? September 8th, tentatively. And then uh, the Temple for Fulton County is tentatively the first week of October. Um, and that, those are the three dates we know for sure. Others are still getting planned. On, the, on our site, on our website? Yes. Uh, they are, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes, uh, yes, Tony. Okay, I love it. I love it here. But, uh, but we're here today to talk about access to justice, and we have these faith leaders in here. Yes. And you're already working with our agency where we have a contract where you're actually doing these programs around the state. We have 17 pilot sites, and in an effort to get this, I hope the judges will hear me in this, we already have an infrastructure of those 17 pilot sites. True. And with your training that you're doing, well, we have to do five more somewhere along there with our yeah. contract. It seems to me database that we have with the faith community and this whole pilot program here we have access to justice that we can look at partnering together to take this show in the road so we can be able to do a dual mm, thing. I like it. I like and it. Since we got leaders in the room like Pastor Simmons and Pastor Francis and some of these other pastors in this room that can get the word out, we can cover the whole state. I like it. I like it. I like it. Let's do it. That's right. You tell you and one and I want to say one more thing. Yes sir one more quick. Yes sir. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I know you all have been putting that together. What, one last one, let me put a plug in for this. And uh, So I mentioned we almost got a bill through this year. We were, well, we were close. We, we got something moving this year to get convictions to allow what I was talking about earlier. The reason, and I want to really want to, to, to echo why these kind of engagements are so important and why these expungement events are so important. The, the, one of the, our main allies who we co-wrote the bill, two bills with, was Paul Howard, the DA of Fulton County. Now, I'm a defense lawyer, okay, so me hanging out with Paul Howard writing a bill about cleaning up people's records, well, you could, I mean, what's going on? I mean, that's upside down, man. There's a, you know, a Hegelian, but it happened because of these events and because of what John did, because of these encounters where people in the community got together and actually heard the stories of people who said, wait, you have a conviction that's 20, 30 years old and it won't come off your record? We got to change that. So these, I really want to you know, pitch that the awareness impact, not only of those events, but all the kind of training that we were involved in. We're up, you know, the, the, re the DOC and DCS is doing a big event, uh, June the 19th, the reentry uh, summit, which I know is already sold out. Uh, but those, it's a great chance to get people aware of these issues and, and activate folks how they can act. So the fact that you know, Paul Howard was one of our, uh, was, I mean, he, I've known him forever, but as we, we co-wrote bills together is in, in large part due to all these ways that we're finding ways to work together. So. Oh, that's good. I've had people reach out to us say they were hoping to go. So that's great. And those are tremendous events. All right. Th thank you. All right. You want to stay? Thank you. And so we're going to change our schedule just a moment to accommodate our next speaker. And I couldn't simply allow him to come forward without giving him a more thorough introduction. This gentleman was born in what used to be the tiny town of Cartersville, Georgia. He went on to graduate from Tuskegee University, attend Harvard University, graduate law school from the University of Georgia, and obtain an LLM from the University of Virginia. And with all his education, that's how he gets to be in his current role as Justice of the Georgia Supreme Court. But that doesn't tell his story. Where there's an opportunity to lend his credentials, to give his life experiences, and to give guidance to young lawyers or young judges, we can always count on this next speaker. An avid worker for justice, 
for all, I present Justice Robert Benham. Thank you very much, Judge, and thank you for allowing me to switch places uh, on the program and be with you uh, uh, this afternoon. I am just thrilled uh, to be here because we now have a union of the law and the Lord here today. Those <laughs> members of the clergy who have been uh, instrumental in this fight for justice over a number of years, I want to thank Tabitha and her staff and Carlise and those who have worked to put this program uh, uh, together. Uh, I must admit that I left my office at around 9.45 this morning and I told my administrative assistant who said that there was work to be done that I would be back in 15 minutes. Uh, somehow it just sort of went on and on and on because I got here and saw so many people that I know, Commissioner Eves, just a lot of elected and appointed officials and a lot of preachers who helped me along the way. And I, Jimmy Hardy is here and Jimmy's granddaddy helped me practice law about 50 years ago. And you know, he would come to court and sit there over on the left-hand side, that's where the court watchers sat, and he would signal me when I was trying cases as to whether I was doing good or bad. <laughs> and the signal was that if he leaned forward, you know, keep it up is what he was saying. But if he leaned back and he crossed his arms, that means shut up and move on to something else. And my wife still uses those signals today. <laughs> So let me set the stage briefly, and it says, it's called a bag of twos, by R.A. say. It says, isn't it strange that princes and kings and clowns that caper and sawdust rings and common people like you and me are builders for eternity. Each is given a bag of twos, a shapeless mass, and a book of rules, and each must make before life is gone a stumbling block or a stepping stone. So I want to share with you just briefly how you can use your bag of twos to turn people's stumbling blocks into stepping stones. At this point in time, people will say, if it's legal, I ought to be able to do it. But think about that. To live in society, a lot of things are legal, but that doesn't mean you ought to do it. And from that, there's an old saying, it says, you catch a sucker and you bump his head. And that's legal, but why should you want to do it? Somewhere along the line, there's a moral aspect in terms of what you should do and how you should do it. And that's why we wanted the preachers to be in the room this morning and this afternoon to help us stay on the right path about that which is moral that we should be able to do. During my some almost, ooh, half a century at the law, I made it my business to always talk to preachers, ask them to come to court, ask them to go over the jury list with me, ask them about certain strategies so that I knew that what I was doing as a lawyer would be something that would be designed to heal the community rather than harm of the community. And it was preachers along the road who would call me and say, at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, there are some people who are at the hospital who can't get any treatment. And we need you as a lawyer to help them get some treatment. And I remember calling the hospital and saying, 
uh, I understand you have so-and-so, so-and-so there, and, and we need to get some treatment for them. And he says, well, Colonel, I have a revolt among my doctors. They don't even want to go on the floor, much less go in the room. And I said, nothing can be that bad. You're treating them as if they had the bubonic plague. And the director of the hospital said, if only they had the bubonic plague, we would be glad to treat them. But then I called on him from a moral standpoint that you have an obligation to heal no matter what the ailment is. And your doctors need to be reminded and the nurses need to be reminded that they have an obligation to heal. And that is what I'm asking you to do. And he said, thank you for reminding me. I'll have another talk with my doctors and nurses. And we need you, members of the faith community, to remind us about our moral obligation to heal the community through the legal process. The law has its limits, but the Lord has no limits. And you must remind us of that and keep us directed in that direction. So I want to applaud you for your participation. Thank you for coming uh, this afternoon. My wife has a list, a long list for me at home that I have to take care of this, this afternoon. And from her decisions, there is no appeal. <laughs> so as you undertake your discussions later on, uh, I'm from what uh, I like to call the romantic generation. And what my wife and children and my son is here today, they said that I'm from what's known as the bygone generation. But just let me share with you a poem called The Violin. It says it was battered and scarred. And the auctioneer barely thought it worth his while. But he picked it up by the bow and managed to get a smile. Now, what is my bid for this violin? Who will start the bidding for me? Then it came, one dollar, two dollars. He begged with someone bid three. Then from the back of the room came an old man who picked it up, dusted it off, and tightened up the strings. Then he played a song a song sweeter than the birds could sing. Then in a voice, soft and low, the auctioneer picked it up again by the bow. Now what is my bid for this violin? Who will start the bidding for me? Then it came, 1,000, 2,000. Someone bid three, and going, gone, said he. One man in the room was confused. He said, I don't quite understand. What was it that changed his failure? To which the auctioneer replied, it was the touch of the master's hand. Thank you very much. Before Justice Benham leaves, we wanted to make presentations to the speakers and so if they would come forward now. The Honorable Rebecca Greist, if she is present, if she'd come forward. The Honorable Letitia Deer Jackson, if she was present. Leslie Spornberger Jones. That's mine. The Honorable Cassandra Kirk. <laughs> Doug Amar, if you all would come forward. Is that everyone? All right, so let me give everyone. To, yes. Thank you. So this obviously was not orchestrated or rehearsed, so let's figure out how you want to do these. Francis Johnson, I apologize. There are more. Adam McDuffie. If I've called your name, if you come forward. How do you know that? We'll just take one. One each. Is someone doing pictures now? This is kind of like the wedding, right? Yes. We're going to interrupt everybody and take some pictures. You're right in front. So let's do them quickly so we can yes. at least stay on time. Yes. I apologize. Thank you. 
Yes. Thank you all for indulging us. We're going to continue. I'm going to invite now Judge Letitia Deer Jackson up to the microphone. She's going to lead our open discussion. And Judge Jackson is the president of the Municipal Judges Association. If you all would come forward. I'm also asking that Mike Monahan, as well as Doug Amar and Miss Dement from Tennessee, if you all would come on up and join us for our panel. Thank you. Good afternoon. Come on, come on. How is everyone? That was kind of sluggish. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Was the lunch that good? Yes. yes. Kick off to Memorial Day weekend. Graduation is out. How you doing? Good to see you, Judge. So we're going to, um, the way that I'm going to do it is we're going to just talk about what happened a couple of years ago when we did the Ferguson Summit back in Macon. Um, and then I'm gonna tell you about a survey that I have spearheaded out of that. So we talked about what are the steps next. And so now we're putting that into action. And then we're gonna have a little dialogue with the panel. And if you have questions, this is open participatory dialogue that we will all have so that we can all come out of here with greater wisdom. So one of the things that we talked about last time back in 2016 was what is next and what can we do on the courts, on the municipal court level. And so as the president of the Council of Municipal Court Judges, as well as as the um, pointee to the Supreme Court's Committee of Access, Fairness, Public Trust, and Public Confidence, we have a survey that is in draft. And that survey deals with really just the access that people would have to the court. It also addresses court recordings, how are you, because the municipal courts are not courts of record at this time um, by law, but we are required to keep recordings of the proceedings, how are those proceedings being recorded? Are you actually recording them um, with them in a compliance with the Supreme Court rules? What are you doing with indigent defense? If you do not have court appointed attorneys, then is it because of a budgetary constraint? And if you were to have that budget increase, would that cause the cessation or dissolution of your court? Or would your court continue to go on? Do you have a pretrial diversion program? And that is a multifaceted question. Pre-trial diversion program is for the benefit of the community and those defendants that come before us, but also you can't have a pre-trial diversion program without a prosecutor. And if you have a prosecutor, don't have a public defender, then that's a systemic problem. So those are other things that we're looking at. Additionally, we're looking at, <clears throat> excuse me, we're also looking at ways that um, services are offered. Do you utilize technology? Do you have remote access to court? Do you do hearings by video or by telephonically? And if not, is that something that you're interested in? And do you have the capability in the court? Are you actually um, working with the American Disabilities Act in compliance with that to make sure that your courts are accessible? Do you have interpreters there for people who English is not their first language or native tongue? So those are some of the things that we've included in, the, in this 
um, survey that is going to go out to all the municipal court judges, and there's over 368 courts, and some courts have just one judge, and some courts have as many as, I think, 10 judges. So it's going to go out to close to 500 judges for them to be able to announce as well as to give us feedback so that we can better give them resources and guidance to make sure that every court is operating efficient in an accessible manner. In addition to that, Judge Rodatis was not um, able to be here, but we have what's a self-help guide that we've been working on on the Access and Fairness Committee as well. And what that is, is for the civil. So, so many times when we think about access and fairness, we think of the criminal matters, but there's so many civil matters that people unfortunately don't have the financial resources and that puts them at a disadvantage. And so what Judge Rodatis has headed up is looking at different things that will help them, whether it's family law, juvenile law, and magistrate court, giving them some of these self-help guides. There are a couple of um, courts that are actually doing it. We have like, for instance, in Fulton County, they have a family Family Law Information Center. They also have one in DeKalb County. Augusta have something for their civil um, cases as well as I believe, Judge Kirk, correct me if I'm wrong, Magistrate Court in Fulton also has some self-help resources for those that are self-represented litigants in small claims courts. And so what we're looking at um, is not only just here in the state, but we're also looking at other states. So Alaska, what is Alaska doing? What is Tennessee doing? And how can we use some of those best practices so that way anyone that comes encounter with the justice system has um, the best shot to have the resources that they need so that way they can feel comfortable and not necessarily feel as if the deck is stacked against them and they're already at a disadvantage. So on the panel we have Mike Manahan, did I say it right? Monahan, who is the Director of Pro Bono Services at the State Bar and has also worked with the Self-Help Toolkit. Is there anything that you want to add to what I've said? Well, I actually work doing the work on behalf of the State Bar's Access to Justice Committee. Okay. And we're really committed to looking at how we can create some standard forms of access across the state because it's very mic. uneven. And I will pick up the microphone right now and keep talking. <laughs> can you all hear that? I'm sorry. I apologize. We're working to create some standardization around the state. Our hopes is that our hope is that people who interface interface with the civil justice system will have 100% access, meaning they'll come in and they'll walk out with something. Because right now, only about 18 to 20% of people who have a civil legal need in Georgia actually get legal help. They actually get a remedy in court or get their problem properly disposed of in a civil court. It's a, it's, it's a pretty uh, awful situation at the moment. It has been for a number of years. We have six counties in Georgia with no lawyer. We have another 29 counties with five or fewer lawyers and another 36 with 15 or fewer lawyers. Um, so we have a massive shortage of lawyers, and many of you think we probably have too many lawyers. That's just wrong. Um, we don't have enough, and we don't have enough lawyers who handle the kind of legal problem that you may have. Um, housing, uh, school-to-prison pipeline cases, eviction issues, basic family law issues, all those kinds of things. And so standardization means, 100% access means access to free legal forms, access to court navigators who can help you with the legal forms, access to podcasts and online technologies that can help you speed through a, a process and get it done. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, and also access to a lawyer, a full-fledged 100% lawyer when you need a lawyer. Sometimes you don't need a lawyer. Sometimes you can help yourself. But the standard forms are, I think, a really important piece of the puzzle. We don't have a unified court system in Georgia, which means if you happen to be down in Hay Hira, Georgia, and uh, Judge Mims knows where I'm talking about, um, or over in Valdosta, Brunswick, Homerville, um, up in uh, Dalton, and um, over through Jefferson, every court form is different. Every court, well, we want the same divorce pleading, but add these two paragraphs. In Thomasville, they'd say, oh no, we don't want those two paragraphs, we want this paragraph. And so no matter where you go, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Imagine, if you will, uh, a low-income household, husband and wife, and they have no assets, they just want to get divorced. They cannot stand each other. They should not be in the same house anymore. We're moving towards domestic violence, right? Why should they have to go through the same divorce process as someone in East Cobb who's got three homes, a vacation, two BMWs in the driveway? It should be easier, correct? Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, uh, so we think, we think standard policies, standard procedures, simplification forms are a very important part of the process. Also, accessing you where you are is an important piece of the puzzle. 
and, I, and we'll have some discussion about the faith-based initiative here in a minute, and we can chime in on that again, but uh, it's important to know that there are lawyers out there looking to make sure that the system is accessible, the civil justice system is also accessible. And Ms. DeMint, if you will, I know you're with the Tennessee Supreme Court's counsel, if you will talk about the initiatives that Tennessee is doing and what is it that we can use here in Georgia? Sure, um, and I apologize, my voice is, a little, I've been losing my voice a little bit, so if you can't hear me, um, you know, I'll, tr I'll try to speak up. But my name is Kimmy DeMent, I'm the pro bono coordinator for the Tennessee Supreme Court Administrative Office of the Courts. Um, and I also am the liaison for what we have is the Tennessee Faith and Justice Alliance. Um, and the Tennessee Faith and Justice Alliance was put in place um, in 2014 um, under the vision of our um, Supreme Court um, who had declared access to justice the number one strategic priority for the courts in Tennessee. Um, and we realized um, the importance of engaging the faith communities in this conversation. Um, one of the statistics that I like to put, I'm a big data nerd and I really, data visualization really helps me understand the enormity of a problem. In Tennessee, we have approximately 1.2 million Tennesseans who fall at the poverty line. Um, at approximately $225 an hour, most of those Tennesseans are never gonna be able to afford an attorney. Um, and in fact, we did a, um, a study recently in Tennessee that shows that the um, average um, person who is at the poverty line in Tennessee experiences between one and six civil legal issues um, each year. Um, and Let me stop you right there. You yes. said one to six civil legal issues a year. What, what is the variety of those one to six? Uh, like you said, what examples of civil legal issues would be things like housing issues, things like family issues, things like um, debt and bankruptcy. So um, not, not criminal issues, but reentry issues do fall into civil legal issues. Um, so things like expungements um, it would, would, would qualify within that. Um, and so that's more than... But when you look at the numbers, it's more than 1.2 million needs per year. And when you look at the amount of attorneys that are in the U.S., there are approximately 1.2 million attorneys in the entire U.S. So even if the whole country came together, everybody chipped in to provide free legal help for the people who need it in Tennessee, we still would just barely cover our need. That's not even Georgia's need. So it really is a problem that goes beyond something that just attorneys alone can fix. Um, and so we look to other solutions. We look, as does Georgia, we look to technology solutions to try to help fill that gap, but we look to our faith communities. And when I talk about faith communities, I tend to talk about mechanics. And you, I, I, you, you hear me out because this is a visualization that helps me a lot understand how these two um, play together. Um, I know very little about cars. Um, and whenever the engine light comes on in my car, I have a lot of um, sort of dismay um, because there are a lot of reasons. Um, I, don't, I don't have a good mechanic that I go to regularly. I don't have any mechanic. I, I don't have a mechanic in my family and I don't um, know much about cars myself. And so engine light comes on, it could be a very little issue, it could be a very expensive issue. And I don't know where to go, I don't know who to go to, I'm afraid someone's gonna rip me off, I've paid too much for car repair in the past. And so rather than go to a mechanic when that engine light comes on, I do a couple different things every single time. One, I ignore it, I hope it just goes away on, it, on its own. Two. I try to Google the answer, and usually that's not helpful to me. I convince myself that my car is literally going to fall apart in the, in, at, at the moment. And three, I call my dad. Now, my dad does not know very much about cars. In fact, the last time I drove my dad's car, his engine light was on. Um, <laughs> so it is not the case that he is an expert on cars, but I trust my dad. I trust him to give me good advice, and to tell me if I really need to go in to see a mechanic. I'm gonna to listen to what my dad has to say about that. And without, without if, I don't, if, I, if, he doesn't, if I don't reach out to him, it, it almost is the case that my car is broken down in the street before I actually begrudgingly take it to the mechanic. And the mechanic takes one look at the car and says, why didn't you come in six months ago? You could have fixed this six months ago, but you didn't, you waited. And the reality is people feel the same way about 
lawyers and legal issues. People don't know, if you don't have a lawyer that you know or already are familiar with the legal system, you're not likely to want to go to a lawyer. They're expensive. You know, they, you, they may talk to you in, in language that you don't understand, either literally or figuratively, words that just lawyer, legalese is what, is, is what we like to call it, you know, and um, you may, it might be a really big expensive issue. It might be nothing. Um, and so rather than go to a lawyer when people have a legal issue, a lot of the times people do exactly what I do with a mechanic. Ignore, Google, and then go to somebody that they trust. And the go to somebody that they trust is a really important piece here because the research suggests that up to 60% of people go to their faith leader or house of faith when they have legal issues. Um, well, sorry, when they have experience some sort of crisis. And so when we talk with faith leaders, I... I work with faith leaders directly. That's a large part of my job is outreach to faith communities and getting faith leaders to understand that people are coming to them for legal help and they can and really should know a little bit about the legal issues, legal resources that are out there to make, you know, to, to, to assist as part of their ministry. And um, when I talk with faith leaders, they say, yes, people are coming to me and they're saying things like, you know, the bills are piling up. I don't know what to do. Or my marriage is falling apart and I'm afraid we're going to lose the kids. Or, you know, all sorts of different, different types of legal, oh, we, I lost the job. And, you know, it, it, um, and so those people are coming early to the lawyer or to the, the faith leader. It may be six more months before they ever get to a lawyer. And by that point, the home may be, may be foreclosed. The, the parenting plan may have gotten so bad that it can really not be fixed in the same way that it could have, have had that person gotten legal help and guidance at the time that they originally reached out. And what I, what I talk about also is how difficult it is to be vulnerable and reach out for help. Nobody really likes to ask for help. I'm like the worst example of this. I, I hate to have to ask for help. It's, it's vulnerable. But when you do reach out for help, you want that baton to be passed fairly quickly to actual help because otherwise you start to think, oh, I can't do it, or oh, there's no solution, or, and that person who has reached out for help, you may be the only person that they ever confide in to talk about, talk to it about. So it really is important that the faith communities understand that, that, that they play a role in this justice work. Um, and the other thing is, you know, we find that, um, you know, people are comfortable going to their house of worship in a way that they're not with the courts. So we do um, four different types of trainings in Tennessee with our Faith and Justice Alliance. We do trainings for faith leaders like this one um, to help faith leaders understand the importance of the issues and um, empower them with some of the res free legal resources that we have in our state um, that the faith leaders can come away with to bring to their, pop their, their communities when somebody comes for legal help. So we do, we do those types of trainings. We um, have a referral network. So um, when a faith leader has, when a congregant goes to a faith leader with legal issues, sometimes I, they will then reach out to me and I will refer them to a lawyer in that community that will... Um, I try to get, make, be able to match that person with a free lawyer um, through our referral network. This can be done without, this can be done on your own. Like this, some houses of worship already kind of do this. Maybe there's a lawyer in your community, you as a faith leader. It, one, one thing we, we, we do know from research is that attorneys respond to people um, who they respect when, they ask, when they're asked to do pro bono. I'm maybe short on time. Um, but... Um, so, for example, if a judge or a faith leader asks them to do something, they're likely to do it. And so you as a faith leader can ask members of your community to volunteer their time, and they may not realize that what they're doing is, um, can be part of their, their ministry and their faith practice. So we, we do that. Um, we also run legal clinics directly through houses of worship. We find that this is particularly helpful for certain types of populations who've had who have limited access to the courts. So for example, very rural areas, the, the, the house of worship may actually be the central point of that community. And that may be where people are already going for legal help. Um, and another two types of populations that we find um, are less likely to turn to a lawyer or a, um, the court are um, people who have had uh, criminal records or immigration issues. Both of those populations tend to have had a bad experience with the court 
but are likely to go to their house of worship um, more than they would a lawyer and, and, and potentially more than other types of, of, of people because they've had a negative, ne negative experience with the courts. So we work pretty closely with both, both of those types of com um, communities. And then the last thing that we do is we actually do legal trainings at houses of worship for, um, we do a lot of know your rights presentations, we do, do a lot of um, business information pr presentations with the idea that when someone comes to those presentations, they may then also be connected with other free legal resources at that time. So. I, go, I don't want to take up all the time. <laughs> Perfect. So that's actually a good segue. Mr. Um, Amar, I want to ask a question. In DeKalb County recently, several entities, um, the district attorney, the sheriff's clerks, and everyone else, they did a big record restriction um, event, and they partnered with one of the local churches there, one of the more um, larger churches there. How do you think that that helped to not only bridge the two communities, but also help those persons that were seeking record restrictions, they felt more comfortable going to a faith-based place as in the church than going directly to the organization? And is that something that you think the faith-based community should look into doing more often? Uh, sure, I and mean, we were there at that event and, um, and helped plan it at St. Philip's AME mm -hmm. on uh, Memorial Drive. Um, and I, interestingly, the next one we know about of these events taking place in Rockdale County is being held at a big Baptist church. Uh, we were uh, Gwinnett County a few about a year ago. The the sheriff, I'm sorry, the, the sheriff of one of the uh, maybe it was the sheriff of the county wouldn't have something about information about the DAs and and he on his own, in fact, asked us to come on a Saturday morning. wasn't as extensive as one of these big events, and it was in the a high school gym. And I and I was you know I was the one who had time that week, so I went. I mean, my staff we do a lot of traveling and talking to people. And I pulled the sheriff aside and said, why are you, you know, this is great, you're doing this, but tell me why did you pick the high school? And he said, well, you know, if we had it at the police office, nobody would come. If we had it at the courthouse, people would be afraid. Uh, so we, having it in a neutral spot makes people less afraid to come talk, much to your point, Mr. Men, about people are afraid if they've got a criminal issue to walk into the police office, walk into a courthouse. I'm a, I'm a lawyer, I'm afraid to walk into the court. No, I'm just but no, no, sometimes, it depends, it depends. So, so I, I was amazed at the level of awareness that, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm as an old white guy, I was like going, wow, that's, that's pretty aware. I was like, dang, I'm. So yes, I think a lot of people when they're planning these events, they want to partner with a church or some local institution because it does de-escalate the tension and it creates more of a warm opportunity. Um, and again, I, I just point out, I'll reiterate what I said about uh, Clayton and Troop Counties is that the, the faith community and this one minister, Reverend Van, has been the, the main force getting these things going and bringing folks together. You know, I, we're working on a number of things around the state around this issue, but what I found at first, and I really do, I know John Eves has left, but I have to always give him credit because nobody was doing this in the state until he got it going. But there is a huge role. I think the, the door has been open, right? And I think for the faith community or anybody in the community, you have the ability to bring people to the table that I as a you know, nonprofit, I can't do. I can't, you know, I can't get the judges and the prosecutors and the clerks as, I mean, you have a particular clout uh, that can be leveraged to the benefit of, of folks. And so, yes, I think the role of the faith community is huge as it relates to these events and, and uh, it's to de-escalate anxiety uh, and create openness, but also to bring, be a gathering point. So yes, I saw, I don't know if you were there, Judge, if you were there that morning. I was not. No, I know Courtney Johnson, I mean, a number of people were there, and the but the point is, yes, it's, a, it's unusual and pretty cool to have all these different, essentially government or as I know in government, is elected and appointed uh, in the room. I mean, I'm a nonprofit guy, so I'm like, well, well that's cool. But the point is, is that having all these sort of power players in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a room, in a church or a place that's not their domain, mm -hmm. uh, but there to help folks who've had a criminal record issue. And so I think it's a, I'm, sorry, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. You but did? Yes, yes. So the second part of the question is, how does the faith-based community take the initiative or what, what do they need to do so that they can start engaging in conversations maybe with some of the elected officials that are there for things such as record restrictions or the self-help and making sure that they have the standardized forms? It's open question. We're actually, from the Access to Justice Committee's point, we have a, a new group 
that we're working on based on the Tennessee model called our Justice for All model. And we're working on a faith-based initiative. Uh, we, uh, Silas Allard, who's a professor at Emory in religion and uh, uh, religious studies, is working on it for us. He's been involved in our Access to Justice Committee now for about a year and a half. He's going to be working with the faith-based faith -based community here in Georgia to develop a survey about uh, ministers, uh, priests, rabbis, congregations, notions of access to justice, the kinds of needs and legal needs that they're seeing. Um, you know, face it, you, you have a food bank in your church, you see people coming in because they've got a food deficit. Why? Because they're being denied food stamps improperly. Or um, they've been evicted and have no refrigerator. Or that electricity has been turned off improperly. Uh, and of course, there's no place to keep food cold, etc. Anyway, the, the point is that we know the faith-based leaders are the place to go to now. Um, thank you, Tennessee. Uh, <laughs> for the great model that you've given us. But we'll be contacting you, and we hope that, like, before I leave today, I can give you my card, and you can give me yours. Um, and, and to further this discussion, it'll be ongoing. We have a, a small grant right now to get him started, and we're helping to uh, find... The Georgia Bar Foundation got us a small grant to get him started, and we're looking on finding more funding for that, op, for that, uh, that piece of the puzzle. But I think it's important in terms of knowing the community's legal needs. We've, we could do as many legal needs studies as we want, but the reality is the boots on the ground know better than we do in the courts and in, 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 in the halls of the, you know, the bar. And, and one thing I'd like to add to that is, um, you know, I, I do a lot of work with faith leaders, but I also have a lot of non-faith leaders participate in my programs. And we, whether they, and, and that's an important Peace. And I think sometimes people um, come to an event like this and we talk, about, talk to faith leaders and, and they think, well, I'm, I'm not a faith leader, like what, what can I add? But the, the truth is, in the same way that I, my dad's not an expert on cars, but I trust my dad, um, I always remind people that, that we are all trusted in some capacity. And so it is helpful for all of us to be ready when somebody reaches out with a baton to make that, pa make that pass and walk with that person. That, that, it's, it's not just faith leaders. It's, it's really any, any leaders, but any, any people, um, you know, it, it's helpful to, to, to do this. When I was working for legal aid, um, I used to do trainings for hairstylists on domestic violence issues because people talk to their hairstylist quite a bit. Um, and, you know, they, they, it's, it's helpful. We went to laundromats. Yeah. So it's, it's not, faith leaders, I, I think, are, 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 um, Key, you know, key players, but but it's not limited to faith leaders. It is also. Uh, go ahead. Just generally, um, you know, being cognizant of of where people are access, reaching out for help, and how can we be there at, in those moments? Um, it, it's the conversation that we you know to be had. Well, and let me just connect a little bit of the dots more substantively for our work, and I think what uh, presumptively your work is. But I mean. The, the work of, of helping people move out of the criminal justice system, as some of the examples I gave, is really a work of redemption and rehabilitation, uh, you know, and really honoring the rehabilitation that people have had. The, the law I, I, the, I talked about that we were trying to push this year and the law that we're, that we're, we're trying to push that 38 other states have, um, it really is about honoring rehabilitation. It's that people can change. And I can't think of any more firmer ground to say that and it will get an amen from a group like this to talk about that we have to believe that people can change. And we have to believe that we're not, you know, as Brian Stevenson, my old friend, says, we're not, shouldn't be judged by the worst thing we did in life. So when I think about moving the needle for folks who've been engaged in the system, and again, lots of ways of moving the needle, direct services, but again, this idea of expungements, this idea of, of a gathering, it is the right place to do that kind of work in a church or a synagogue. It is the right place to do this kind of work to get momentum to move the policy so that the judges, like Judge Kirk, have the chance to sort of say, and the way these laws work, is to say, look, yes, you made a mistake 5, 10, 20, 30 years ago, but we should not forever hold that against you. Uh, I'll say the one video I almost played, if I had more time, was a video we used out of a group out of New York. It's a legal nonprofit there, and I love the name because this is how I talk about it. It's called Perpetual Punishment. And the idea is once you've engaged in the system, you really are perpetual punishment. You know, when George Bush, the gov uh, President George Bush came up with second, second uh, chances, uh, you know, or uh, um, um, I, I always thought this is about the second punishment. We've got to end second punishment to create second chances. So I think the, the faith community particularly is, is well positioned to engage, whether it's on a direct service side, from a policy to host events, because this, uh, this message and this need 
is deeply core to what I believe is your mission and your values. Does anyone have questions? We want to open it up for questions that you may have, and we can answer those questions. So my understanding, well, we have the camera that's here, and it's my understanding that it will be um, available. Is it going to be, Tabitha, through the Supreme Court's website, or is it the Access of the Administrative Office of Courts? Administrative so it will be through the Administrative Offices of the Courts. Yes. My name is Larry Mims. I'm from South Georgia, Tifton, Georgia. And some of the issues that, that we're talking about here today um, are, are very, very profound where I am because the resources are so limited, the number of attorneys are limited, uh, the attitude is one that has been persistent for years, and so we've got a big battle on our hands. But I want to just talk a minute to uh, some members of the faith-based communities about the needs that I see and where they can plug in to help us in the area that we're in. Uh, one of the the things that we've tried to do and, and we tried to do as a judge is to provide opportunities for people uh, to avoid uh, being in the criminal justice system. Uh, we, we tried to do pretrial diversions that, that gave young people the opportunity to save their lives and, and offered them the opportunity to go to school or to get a job in lieu of having criminal prosecutions. And my wife is, work, is still working with that program with uh, Southern Regional Technical College. But one of the things that we have found that are a critical need in our area is transportation. You know, we say to people, uh, go to school, get a GAD, get a job, but I have folks who live in, in rural areas, and they may live 10 miles outside of Tifton. So there's a, there's a real need for folks to have transportation. So as a faith-based community with all these church vans and these buses and these things, we need you to come in and step in and help us get these people to where they need to be. The other thing that we need in those areas is the opportunity for you to come in and see how our court systems functions. Court is open. Courts belong to the people. So I would love to see some of our ministers, some of our parishioners go into the court, sit there, listen, watch, and understand what is going on. Because we can talk all day about those things that are happening, but once you see it, some of the things will, 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 will literally stun you and appall you. So I encourage you to go into your communities, sit in these courtrooms, and understand kind of what's going on. So you'll know uh, an approach to help folks. Uh, and the third thing is, as faith-based community, you can be encouragers. People need mentors. People need folks who can say, you can do it. I'm behind you. I forgive you. Let's go and try to get you on the right path. So those are some of the practical things that I think you all can do to help. And what we've been able to try to accomplish is to try to give people the opportunity to save their lives by avoiding them to going into the criminal justice system. And of course, they're going to make mistakes. Of course, they're young. So we have to be here to provide them with those opportunities. And I'm, and I'm very fortunate to say that in Tiff County, one of the positive things that we've been able to do is to have a pretrial intervention program that allows folks to, to have a choice between going to school or getting a, a trade at the tech school or getting a job. And those are the kinds of things that are important to get people back on the right track. Judge Mims, um, I really like your bus idea in transportation. We've been trying to figure out how to create a justice bus to take lawyers out of areas where we have a lot of lawyers to drive them into small towns to, to help, you know, to get good thinking lawyers into areas that need good thinking lawyers. Um, if we could have a few church buses, uh, you know, every few months to get some of our lawyers down there, we'd love to do that. Okay, thank you. And I'm available to, I mean, if, if anybody wants to talk to me about how you can plug in and help us, uh, I'd, I'd be happy to talk to you. Absolutely. Something else that you said that wor is worth repeating is the engagement. So it's bilaterally, though. So if the, the faith base is engaging the courts to see what's going on, but also the courts have to engage the faith-based community. So everyone has the same um, information, and it's not one person is taking the initiative. If both are doing it, then you meet in the middle, and everyone has the same um, education, and then they can go back out into the community for the betterment of the citizens and constituents. I think I saw a hand over here. Thank you. 
Um, Mr. Ramor and uh, Mr. Loudon uh, communicated openly in, uh, uh, before this discussion about how they can meet together and work on um, a circuit to uh, go to the communities and, and jurisdictions and communicate to the communities and the jurisdictions. Um, and so in this discussion here, uh, it was discussed about um, uh, some of the things that can be achieved. And I thought, well, is this an access? The discussion we have here, would this access that we had just had in this discussion be made available? And uh, the title of Mr. Amor and uh, the title of Mr. Loudon in their actions today, can they uh, participate in informing the communities of uh, the uh, discussion that we had, Reflections of Justice? Uh, to the communities and the community leaders. Thank you. Right here up front. Is that, yeah. And then you'll be next. I mean, I, I can, can, right behind you. Right here. My name is Daniel Simmons, and I pastor um, church in Albany, Georgia. And um, I'm smiling because. Um, Part of the conversation sounds like there needs to be an initiative because these things are not happening. Mm -hmm. And what I want to say is uh, that the faith-based community, and in particular church that I pastor, is 153 years old. We've been doing this for 153 years. Mm -hmm. And so part of the reason um, the partnerships may not be there is because some people are not aware that the church is willing and able to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I'll give you, um, I think he's still back there, uh, Tony Loudon, if he's still there. Um, you know, from, from day one, we've been a part of the reentry process. Um, in fact, uh, the announcement for much of it was done by the governor in our church. Okay. Wow. And we participated on the front end, in the middle. And, and on the back end of that, uh, there's a um, uh, our chief judge in town partners with the faith-based community on the front end to try to prevent young people from choosing prison. So he does a court at the jail and allow young people to come in, and he actually stops during the proceedings and point out to young people um, times, situations, circumstances that created the problem for the person to be on trial, explains the proceedings, uh, allows them to go in the, in, into the jails to see what was happening. There are all kind of innovative things going on um, already in these partnerships, transportation, um, being in court with them, but what we try to do is cut it off at the path before they get in court uh, through relationships and just allowing some, some things to happen. And so what I want to say is that the uh, faith-based community, we are, we are willing and ready. And a lot of times you have not because you ask not mm -hmm. or um, somebody somewhere just fell either on our side as a faith-based community, on the court side or school side, whatever, just fail to take the initiative to just ask. And so sometimes we don't have as a church because we don't ask. And sometimes, you know, others don't have because they don't ask us. Well, I really appreciate that. I, 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 I'm glad to hear that, but I just want to warn you, sometimes it's hard to disabuse lawyers of the fact that they are not the most important people in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lawyer. I can say that. And, and I, was, I would say this. We think we can handle every problem that's out there on our own, and we, and we fail to share the problem. And I, and I would say this. Now, we partner with attorneys. Um, we do free legal clinics in Albany, and there are attorneys who come from Atlanta. Uh, to participate in those clinics at their own expense. And out of those clinics, they do pro bono service. Mm -hmm. He had a question or a comment. I guess my question is, um, my question is, um, I, was, I, raised, I was raised up in South Georgia and matriculated other places, but I go back to South Georgia a lot because my father's there and I have family there and I have people that call me for court hearings. I'm an itinerant pastor. I used to pastor four times. I'm an itinerant pastor now. But my question is, are there any initiatives to help, I guess, cushion 
the faith-based community from the initiative that you all are doing to have a dialogue with the DAs and the, and the judges in South Georgia. Uh, their temperament is really appalling, uh, is really unconstitutional. Um, I was in the, I had the privilege of being with Governor Nathan Deal and he was appalled and he said he'd never seen anything like that in his life as far as South Georgia judges. There are some uh, offenders that are sitting in jail three, in the local jails three and four years. Mm. What I have at the trial, they make them trustees, they get free labor from them and, and a lot of the rural areas, the sheriff kind of runs the city. He has the biggest budget, has the nicest cars, he has the armored tanks. And I'm just wondering, are there any initiatives that could take place to put this on blast? I am not aware of one right now, but I'm taking notes. And this is something that I'll be taking back to the committee. And this committee is comprised of judges from all um, levels of court, classes of courts, as well as attorneys. Um, and it's chaired by Justice Benham and Justice Hunstein. And so this is something that um, creates Ferguson type issues. Mm. And so in that I will be having this discussed in our meetings so that we can look at if there's something that we can do from a committee and employ resources down to South Georgia um, to create an awareness about that. So, so if, I, if I might, I, I mean, I appreciate you mentioning this, and, and uh, I should say our, our practice at our office, our criminal defense practice is just Fulton and DeKalb, but we do our criminal records work all over. We worked a lot down with the Albany Reentry Coalition. In fact, that picture, I don't know if you saw, was all Albany State, the, the criminal justice club from the Albany State who's been helping us for years. And, and we've known for a long time that there's, there's really two kinds of justice in the state. I mean, you know, at least in South Georgia, and we you see and hear just, I would want to echo what I've known and what you've said. I, mean, I think that's right. And, and I think I, I would be, I mean, I think you're right. There's such a great momentum in this state at some levels to sort of change the, the, the dynamic, change the dialogue, change the way things are, how we do criminal justice. And it's obviously happening from the top level on down. Uh, and I always wonder how much of that is reaching. I mean, I don't know if you know, there's a, the, Put, the Putnam County Sheriff, uh, you know, went on record as saying that the, the, the governor was Lucifer for all the work he's doing on criminal justice reform. And, and how, I'm like, okay, I mean, that, I mean, he's been on record of saying lots of crazy things, but he said that this past year. I'm like, this is the elected sheriff of a county who says that, you know, whatever is going on and this idea of keeping nonviolent offenders and dealing with their issues and reducing the prison population, helping folks not come back to prison, that that's the work of the devil. So, my brother, if, that, if you've got people saying that in South Georgia, we should all be praying for South Georgia. I mean, because you've got a huge hill to climb. You know, there were some efforts we know down in the Cornelia down years ago to do some court watching and sort of publishing what judges were doing. Uh, that doesn't exist anymore. Mike reminded me of that. But, but the point is there's a lot of room there. I, I don't even, I don't have the answer to it at all, but I just want to, I'm going to say, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and, you know, I would be happy to be helpful and a part of whatever effort the bar, the, the courts could, could come up with. The, the civil rights movement, the 50s and 60s, has so much to teach us lawyers about how to watch the courts, how to deal with these things. So uh, we should have a lot, more, much more discussion about that, definitely. I only work, I work on the civil justice side, not the criminal justice side. But I do see in our work that moving standard forms into courts, getting a standard sort of approach to pauperous affidavits, which means free filings of, of court cases for indigent folks who you know, need to get into court on civil matters, that's an issue. There are a lot of gatekeepers, not just in the courts, but the rural South is like famous for its gatekeepers and their, their, their wonderful capabilities of being gatekeepers, keeping people away from things or you know, keeping that door closed so they can't find something unless you know the secret words. That, that's, that's kind of common in my world. Something that I will say is um, I've been a judge for 11 years and I recognize that it's an honor to serve and because I recognize it's an honor, I tell anyone, you can come, come to my court, see what my judicial philosophy is, see what I am doing. Um, and in that, I always, when I talk to the council municipal court judges and the trainings, I always say, when you handle any case, 
Handle it as if someone is recording you and it's going to be public. They're gonna go to the news, they're gonna put it on the internet, it's gonna go viral. And I think, and what I will do is I will challenge you, um, go to any courtroom and just sit there and there are new rules, so you'll just need to look at the rules to make sure that you are operating um, in that particular class of court about recordings or anything, but you have to go. And part of it sometimes is judges get too comfortable. And if we're not held accountable because internally, sometimes we need external accountability. And so what that means is if you're there and you see something, it's almost like, I mean, I'm in Metro, so I'm sorry for the South um, Georgia people, but on MARTA, it says, see something, say something. And so it's one of those, if you're there and you're just observing, no one can prohibit you because every court here is open. And if you are um, asked, why are you there? or you are excluded or uh, excused from the courtroom, then you need to bring that to the attention. Um, that's a major violation. But also if you're there, then you have to talk about it. And sometimes you have to create your own momentum to make sure that there's an accountability um, for how the courts are handling. We have 10 minutes left. I wanna get as many comments right I, here. And then, um, ma'am, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, can I piggyback on what you just said and what the gentleman over here said? 60 seconds. Okay. As a former South Georgia judge, I cannot ex express how important it is for you in the faith-based community to get involved in coming to court and observing and also encouraging your parishioners to do the same. I think that's one of the most effective tools that you have in terms of holding judges accountable is that you're sitting there, you're looking them in the face, you're watching them handle their business, and they have to, I mean, they're elected, most of them. And if they, they aren't elected initially, they will be elected at some point. So they are, they are responsible to you. So I think it's important, that's the important first step, I think, in terms of trying to understand what's going on here and how you can make an impact in the way that people are treated in court. Right, right here and then right here. Hi, my name is Terry Montague. I just wanted to follow up both of your comments. So let's say I'm an observer mm -hmm. in your courtroom and I observe something disturbing. What is my recourse? Disturbing on behalf of the judge or just overall? Overall. So if it's something overall, you can bring it to the attention of the court to the judge. You can bring it to the security nine times out of 10. You can't just walk up to the bench. Um, in any court or jurisdiction, you're going to have a police officer, a deputy, or marshal, or something like that to do it. You can step outside and speak to the clerk if it's one of the smaller courts. Um, if it's something impermissible um, that a judge has done, then you have the right to um, contact the Judicial Qualifications Commission, which is short for JQC, and that's the judicial watchdog that um, is over every judge. And we have canons. There are um, canons, and you can go on JQC. I think it's jqc.ga.gov. Um, but if you just Google jqc.georgia or Georgia, it'll come up. There are canons that every judge, whether you are part time or full time, are bound by. And you can look at those canons and it will tell you. And if you see something that is impermissible, then you have the right to report it. And what if the concern is more the quality or lack of quality of the representation of the person who is um, the defendant? That's a touchier subject. Um, if it's a criminal case, a criminal defendant always has the right to file an appeal for ineffective assistance of counsel. If it's a civil case um, and there is clear malpractice or something, that person can file a bar complaint. Um, they can also file a bar complaint on a criminal. But if it's subjective of you don't think that that person is getting quality, um, quality um, assistance, that's more subjective in that. Yes, sir, and this, yes, sir. I, Give me one I second, ma'am. Give I me may, one second. Sure. Chime in. Thank you. Hold on. Um, 60 seconds, yeah. gentlemen, and then I have a lady in the back. Um, one other thing to add to that is, and um, I'm in, in Tennessee, um, you know, so we have a different, different judges and different judicial system and problems, but um, I, I assume that we're very similar in that um, sometimes we have to do some trainings for our judges to bring them up to speed, whether in sensitivity issues or whether in uh, actual legal issues. And I think there are certainly times where there are, there's um, overt 
um, problems within the, the system, but there are also some times where you may have, people may observe things that just feel wrong, but maybe are not illegal or maybe not malpractice. Um, and in those situations, um, sometimes what is helpful to do, I used to work for the Legal Aid Society in, um, in Nashville, and we would sometimes have you know, people reach out to us and say, I'm kind of observing this in our court, and, you know, and then we would, we as c people who were very familiar with the court system would then reach out to those judges and have a conversation and say, you know, we're, we're seeing this happen. It may not necessarily be illegal, but it might be insensitive, or you may not be considering this or that. Um, so there are ways, there's certainly things that require, you know, that, that could require, um, I guess, sp specific sets of action that are, are, are um, but then there are also conversations that can be had that can turn the needle on practices that you're observing that just may require a little bit of training, a little bit of... Um, Understanding, so there, you know, is one one thing to always kind of keep in mind. There. All right, I have five minutes now. I know for lawyers, judges, and preachers, that's like that is hard. So well, well I'm a I, lawyer, and hold I just on, have I have the lady, and then I have this gentleman, then I have this gentleman. Okay. Sixty seconds. Okay, my comment was uh, a suggestion is that perhaps we can have a hotline because not everybody knows the number to the Judicial Quali uh, uh, Judges Qualifications Committee. So a hotline, because the law lawyers have them all over the state, call Ken Nugent, call this, call that. And perhaps they need something in South Georgia and everywhere else to have a number that is re easily recognizable, 1-800 number, call this number on, and to report mis judicial misconduct or whatever they see so that they can immediately do it without having to uh, go Google or look up something. Right. So I'm not, I'm not aware, right, I'm not aware that there is a movement that has been formed, um, but from here you have the resources to have conversations. You've heard from a lot of the panelists, so we can talk with them um, individually and see what we can also do to go out back into the community. I, re yeah. I recall yeah. that the ACLU of Georgia had formed a rapid response kind of approach with volunteer lawyers around the state okay. when it came to protests and arrests after protests. That may be a network that you could probably tap into. Um, well, I meant, but the I... Yeah, well, what he's well, I, saying is when they had the civil unrest and they had um, protests going on, the ACLU was able to train and implore um, attorneys to go to different parts of the state to represent people who might have found themselves arrested. And so he's saying that may be a network to tap into yeah. for what you were asking. Yeah. As a lawyer, I wouldn't want to own that. I mean, that's, that's a shared thing. And I think it's probably best to come up out of the community rather than for us to sort of push that down. I, I don't know how that would look, actually. I'm Samuel L. Pridgen. I want to say that I think this is a brilliant forum. Thank you. But in response to what I heard earlier, I want to say relative to judges, all judges are different. And since I pastor in rural Georgia with Judge Mims, former Judge Mims, you have to get to know the judges. Mm -hmm. And you have to help them to understand that this person of whom I'm talking to you about is important. And mm -hmm. that's what I wanted to say. If you get to know the judges, then maybe they will work with you just a tad bit more than they would a stranger. Absolutely. Off the it's all about relationships, so that's very important. All hearts and minds cleared? <laughs> okay. All right. Come on up, Judge Kirk. Thank you, Judge Jackson. Thank you.
And so as you all can tell, we are wrapping up. Thank you, Judge Dear Jackson, for such a great presentation. I appreciate it. And thank you to our panelists. If you all would just stay seated for just a moment, I'm going to go ahead and introduce you all to Adam McDuffie, who is with the Center for the Study of Law and Religion. And he is going to speak for about 10 minutes on how he is interacting with this topic, as well as give you all a call to action. After Adam finishes, we are going to ask that you complete your survey. You all also know that as part of this experience, we have tickets that have already been purchased to the museum. We are encouraging you all to go tour the museum. You are here, make it worth your while. And then there is also a reception, so there'll be time for the tour and then the reception. Adam. Thank you very much, and I uh, thank you all for having me today. Um, Silas Allard of the Center for the Study of Law and Religion, I'm sure wishes he could be here, and I also wish he could be here. No. <laughs> I will do my best to tell you as much as I possibly can. Um, first of all, I really do want to say how excited we are with the State Bar's Justice for All initiative that the Judicial Council's Access to Justice Committee has partnered with us, and they've committed to adoption of our Justice for All strategic plan and several of the projects that we've proposed, including the work that we're doing with the Doherty County Law Library to create a model for, at the local level, assisting self-represented litigants through strengthening local libraries, but also working to build accessible platform for self-help online forms, local pop-up legal clinics, and low bono methods of attorney representation. For my part, I'm here to talk to you specifically about the State Bar's Justice for All initiative as it relates to faith-based work, as we've talked about briefly before now. The need here is very clear, as we've been talking about all day, that, as I think it was Tony Loudon who said this morning, there are certain people who lack on-ramps. I think that's an incredible way to talk about this. There are individuals and communities all across the state who just lack the on-ramp to get to the legal resources that they need. We're just trying to build some on-ramps. We're trying to identify areas where that need is present and to find ways to confront that need and solve the problem. And the area that we've found most beneficial to do this is faith communities. As we've been talking about, this is really fertile ground to be working on this. What we're trying to do is to educate ministers and to educate religious leaders on how they can provide information to their congregants, but also to how they can best identify legal issues on their own. And so specifically, what we're trying to do is to craft a study. And so this will be a qualitative study that will be across the state and across religious traditions, it won't be purely Christian, because this isn't purely a Christian problem. And the study will seek to ask religious leaders across the state what they know about legal issues and what they know about how to identify congregants who need help and how to get those resources to them. And what we'll attempt to do from that study is to take the results and then try to craft a curriculum for those religious leaders. And that curriculum will take multiple forms. It could be one-on-one -on -one distributed to religious leaders as individuals. It could be a continuing education seminar like this one. It could be in a seminary curriculum. Part of the model for this that I found really helpful is to think of the way that seminaries currently are handling pastoral care education. As a recent one week ago seminary graduate, I can speak to the way that this has been incredibly effective for pastors who are not really equipped to know when to refer in cases of mental health there's been a lot of work at seminaries to train pastors not to try to solve every problem because they don't have the tools for it and to equip them with the ability to refer people who need to be referred. If we take that template and apply it to legal care and access to legal resources, I think that would be really helpful. And so that's what we're attempting to do here with creating this curriculum. And part of what's needed in that is humility on the part of legal, or on the part of religious leaders because as, again, as someone recently coming out of seminary and knowing what we're educated in, just learning how to navigate the tax code as a new pastor is incredibly complex. Everyone tells you how to do it different ways. If we can expect to also be able to provide access to real legal help to our parishioners, then we're just, we're over our heads. The better we can equip our religious leaders to do this, then the more access we'll be able to provide people. And so at the moment, we don't really have a firm timeline. We're kind of in limbo waiting for funding. But we do think this is a really powerful project that can provide a really strong solution. As we have seen from Tennessee, it's, it's doable and meets a real genuine need. And so we see in churches just ample untapped resources. And we ask that you would be willing to help us help you to start a dialogue and to talk about what you're looking for in your congregations and what we can be looking for to help you. 
So thank you. Uh, please. <laughs> Uh, I have uh, been called upon, and I'm happy to fulfill this role, but we are, on behalf of the Access to Justice Committee of the Bar, and I'm empowered to speak on behalf of the Access to Justice Committee of the Judicial Council, we are extremely committed to this concept, and while we've been able to get you a little bit of money to start with, we are really focusing in on, on the long term and keeping this movement going, and we are really, really very much interested in hearing from the faith-based community on, uh, on faith-based lawyering, on faith-based uh, navigators on getting into local communities to hear from you and how we can work together. So as, you, as this year progresses and as the survey is developed and is being developed, I, I, and I believe in, in conjunction with, um, with the community, uh, we really hope that you pay attention and that you give us a hand. Um, I am pro bono at gabar.org or Mike at the Georgia Bar. You can contact me that way and I'll connect you with the people. And there are two people in the room who really, I think, we owe a lot of credit to on the effort of Guy Lesko, who is now the interim director of Legal Services of Alabama, mm -hmm. and uh, Charlie Lester at the law firm of Sutherland, who are on the Access to Justice Committee and have really been pushing the justice for all efforts. And if you guys would please stand. In this faith-based action. Uh, it's Guy and then Charlie behind you. Um, please, please search them out during the reception and, get, and chat with them. They have information. And of course, with Adam here, and I'm happy to help in it however I can. Thank you all. And let's give them another hand. I want to add those foundational surveys. How, let me see by a show of hands all of the faith based leaders who have filled out those surveys. And do I have any that? that's not been taken up, if you'll hold them up, I'll have somebody come get them. Those are actually the foundational surveys to, to this entire project. So we are starting today. And we want you guys to stay involved, and we need your help. And if you are willing to stay engaged and help us throughout this strategic plan, we have a plan, but we need your help. So if you are willing to stay engaged throughout the process, it may be a year, it may be two, but we have to stick with it and get it done. I would like for you to please be sure to leave your name at the registration table, and I will be sure to get in touch with you. We've also done some foundational interviews today when we called out a few pastors earlier. We were asking information so that we can get this project going. So we, are, we have started, so let's give us a hand. A few other items, if you are a faith-based leader, one of our guests, you've driven over 50 miles, you can be re reimbursed for travel, for your gas. Um, 50 miles one way, it has to be over 50. You need to come and do this. <laughs> and, and I do know we need W-9s for those. Okay, just make sure. Those who have traveled, you have over 50 miles one way, that means you have to have traveled 100 miles. We will reimburse you, but you'll see the um, Tanya Osby, she's sitting at the registration table. She will um, direct you on how to be reimbursed. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, and you'll need to complete a W-9. Our office requires that in order for us to pay you, okay? Thank you. We are about to do some evaluations. So if I can have, you're gonna see them pass, they're gonna be passed, or they're being passed out. If you'll fill those out quickly, and then we have a treat for you. We have um, arranged a tour, and there will be someone to start us on this guided tour, and you'll get to see the museum. But if you would kindly please fill out the evaluations, thank you. And I will say after the, um, the tour, we'll come back to a reception, and you guys can mix and mingle and have those conversations. Thank you. Thank you.